Hello and welcome. Newell released their CPU benchmark called CPU Profile in June 2021. This is under the 3D Mark banner. On their news page, they title it New CPU Benchmarks for Gamers and Overclockers. CPU benchmarks are obviously not a new thing and have been around for a while. Each one has their focus and UL are clearly saying this one is geared towards gamers and overclockers. I will be taking a look at what it does and what factors affect it or not. So what does this benchmark claim to do? The workload is described as a combination of physics computations and custom simulations, whatever that is. It runs different numbers of threads doing the same workload to determine the performance at that thread count. It tests 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 and the maximum number of threads supported by the CPU, which may duplicate one of the previous ones. Before we get to interpreting those results, let's see the benchmark running. This is a run on my desktop with an i7-8086K and a 2080 Ti. The video card shouldn't make a difference as they measure the time per frame rather than the frame rate. My particular CPU is power limited to 95 watts as I bought a cheap motherboard and it is unstable when running without a power limit. That's another story. Note I did this with a video capture running, so that will likely affect the results also. We see it start with maximum threads, which on this CPU is 12 threads. 6 cores, 12 threads. Next is 16 and we go down through 8, 4, 2, 1 before getting to the final results page. The workload on each run is the same, differing only in the number of threads used, so it visibly gets slower as we reduce the number of threads. Ok, let's skip to the results. At the top we see the 6 scores for each thread count tested. These are comparable with each other. A higher number represents more work done, higher is better. If we start at the single thread score and compare the two thread score, if we have perfect or ideal scaling, we would expect it to double. We see it is slightly less than double. This isn't unexpected, as there can be some scaling overhead from running multiple threads. Likewise, at 4 threads, it is a bit less than double the 2 thread score. At 8 threads, we see something quite a bit less than double again. This is expected, because we now have exceeded the number of cores the CPU has, which is 6. Now we're making use of Intel hyper-threading, which can give additional performance by running 2 threads through a single core making use of different parts of the core and extracting more performance that way. However, it is far less work than an extra real core could do. At 12 threads, which is the CPU maximum, and 16 threads, we see similar higher scores again. A small difference here is not really significant at less than 1%. Now we are making use of hyper-threading on all the cores at the same time, not just some as it was the case at 8 threads on 6 cores. According to the 3D Mark pages, they offer guidance that single thread score doesn't well represent modern use cases. I don't entirely agree there. If the system is mostly idle, many tasks are still single threaded and a good score here can translate into better responsiveness. However, if you run many background loads, even at low activity, then it could push it to two or four active threads, which they characterise as representative of older games. Certainly up to the release of Ryzen in 2017, most mainstream CPUs were limited to 4 high performance cores, with many on the more value end capable of executing 4 simultaneous threads, those with deeper pockets going up to 8 threads. The 8 thread score is stated by the benchmark as being better representative of modern games. This seems reasonable as 6 and 8 core CPUs have been offered for new mainstream systems since the release of Ryzen in 2017. Before that, you had to pay to go to the high-end desktop or HEDT systems if you wanted more than 4 strong cores. A common misunderstanding that some make is that thread count directly scales with performance. The benchmark text does try to guide the user, noting that scaling should be good up to the number of cores the CPU has. As mentioned before, the bulk of the work is done by the first thread on each core, with diminishing returns on the second thread. As an example, say you were offered a 6 core 12 thread CPU, or an 8 core 8 thread CPU. A naive person would think the 12 thread CPU would be better, but in practice the 8 core 8 thread CPU would expect to do more work on average, and may be more consistent about it. There may be edge cases where the 6 core 12 thread CPU does better than an 8 core 8 thread CPU, but they would be in the minority. An example of the 8 core 8 thread CPU would be Intel's i7-9700K, which did not feature hyper-threading.
Here we see it score an average of 5923 points. An example of a similar 6 core 12 thread CPU would be the i7-8700K which averages 5383 points. What about a more modern 6 core CPU? Take AMD's 5600X which averages 5752 points. More than the older 6 core Intel CPU but still less than the 8 core. It should be noted that threads are only one of many variables that contribute to CPU performance. The clock speed will differ between these models and how much work each can do per clock cycle will not be the same either. Back to the scores. The green bar shows the score obtained by the benchmark run. The black mark shows the median result of submitted benchmark results. This is the result you get if you sort all the submissions in order and pick the middle one. If you are far below it then your system is underperforming. If you are much above it, chances are you are overclocking. If you are close to it, you are in the middle of the pack. Some small variations will be present depending on other factors on each system. The grey part of the bar is the difference between your score and the best submission, so it indicates potential headroom if you choose to overclock. What overclocking is and if you should consider doing it is a whole topic in itself, I won't be covering it here. On my specific result, my green bar is a little bit short of the black marker. This is probably due to me running the CPU with the 95 watt power limit I mentioned earlier, as well as doing the video recording at the same time. Most enthusiast systems would likely be running without a power limit and attain more performance at the cost of power efficiency. In the monitoring section, we can see the CPU clock and temperatures over time. You may see the CPU turbo clocks differ depending on how many cores are in use at the time. Generally speaking, you might hit higher clocks when fewer cores are running. If you are running on a power limit, that may further influence clocks over time, and depending on the level of cooling, you may see performance drop to keep temperatures under control. So that's what the benchmark is supposed to do, now I test what it actually does. I ran it on several systems I own in various settings and configurations. Try to see what impacts the benchmark score and what doesn't. Following is a summary of that. The benchmark did seem stable in the results it gave, typically runs vary by less than 1% under the same settings on the same system. It didn't noticeably scale at all with memory speed. This was tested on a i5-10600K, uh, which is a 6 core CPU. I ran dual channel memory from 2400 to 4000 transfers per second and it made no noticeable difference. I didn't try something more extreme like going to single channel or maybe if you had a much higher core count system like 32 cores or more that would make more of a difference. But suffice to say for a typical gamer system this benchmark is not directly affected by RAM speed. AMD systems might have an indirect effect due to the way their internal clocks are tied to the memory controller, but I don't have such a system to test myself. Scaling with CPU core clock seemed to be close to ideal, only in the case where I halved the clock from about 4.8GHz to 2.4GHz, the lower clock result might have been about 2% better than expected. This is still close to the margin of error between runs, so I'm hesitant to call it as significant. For normal operating conditions, I think we can disregard this. Since I have both Intel 11th gen Rocket Lake and 10th gen Comet Lake CPUs, I did a clock and core normalised comparison between them. This then shows the architecture difference in isolation. Rocket Lake came out about 20% better per clock. This is a much newer architecture, so an improvement was expected. I don't have a modern AMD desktop system at the moment. I do have a mobile Zen 3 CPU in my laptop though and that came out about 5% behind Rocket Lake. The desktop version should do better as it has much bigger caches on the CPU itself. The thread scaling of the benchmark was not ideal. Performance did seem to drop off as the thread count increased, even taking into consideration hyper-threading or symmetric multi-threading effects. It still shows an improvement over fewer threads, just not as much as it could be if it scaled perfectly. For peak scaling indication, Cinebench remains the obvious choice. Running the benchmark on three CPUs with different levels of AVX512 support, the conclusion was this benchmark doesn't use AVX512 as there was no significant difference between them that could be explained by AVX512. This is not unexpected as AVX512 is not widely supported in mainstream CPUs. In the desktop space, it was only just added to the current Intel Rocket Lake CPUs. Going back, it first appeared on high-end desktop systems with Skylake X CPUs. Intel mobile CPUs have had it for two generations now, but not necessarily in great numbers in the gaming laptops.
Currently, no AMD CPU supports it at all. This may change your future CPUs. In cases where software can already gain from using AVX2 instructions, AVX512 support should give it a further boost in performance, so it is something to look forward to. So to end, I'll recap some of the features of the benchmark. As a positive, the benchmark does provide scores for running different numbers of threads. It doesn't try to give one score to represent every situation. A single value just can't represent that complexity. So on the negative side, because it's not a single value, people might be lazy and not want to use it for that reason. People want one number to compare to say that whatever they're doing is better than something else. It has to be the right number and single value benchmarks have to be used with caution in that area. So this benchmark in itself, I don't think is going to change that problem, but it's not its job. It's, it's providing the information people can use if they choose to. If you spend time to look at it, you can get more value out of it. There is still a bit of an open question mark on how representative the benchmark workload is to actual gaming. It doesn't necessarily represent other workloads, even in similar categories. For example, other people have done testing on games and have shown that many games do scale somewhat with RAM speed, whereas this benchmark does not seem to show that. And finally, this benchmark requires the user to have 3D Mark Advanced, which is a paid software option. It is not free. The software itself is quite often on discount, and at the time of making this video, it is on discount, down from $30 to under $5. Uh, I'm not sponsored, so I can't help further in that area, but if you want it, I'm sure you can find a way to buy it. Because it requires payment, it will limit its adoption and it won't dethrone other benchmarks like Cinebench as a go-to CPU benchmark. And at least not in the enthusiast space. And that is it. Let me know if you have any questions or want any more details. Thanks for watching and see you next time.